to your presentation, actually. I have written some words here in reaction, not to your presentation, but to your paper on predatory rent gap that you sent us. And I think that your presentation is a partial synthesis between two papers of yours, which is the planetary rent gap and missing Marcuse on gentrification and displacement. Okay, you see, I'm not a geographer. I'm just an architect, urban planner, and designer teaching in a design school. So I will not be able to comment on a paper by a radical geographer and critical urbanist. First, I'm not knowledgeable enough about the landscape of human geography to position your paper vis-a-vis -vis the literature in the field or to assess or discuss if it was successful, a successful attempt, as you say, to posit some possible extensions to the theory vis-a-vis -vis territorial stigmatization and displacement. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, from my perspective, which may be conceptually simple or even simplistic. I qualify your intervention simply as a radical analysis of rent gap theory from a Marxist perspective, mm -hmm. which makes it from the outset a one-sided analysis of limited use to us planners and designers who have to deal with the complex reality where there is no left or right but the complex and complicated interface between the two. As John Lang, their uncomfortable coexistence. Unfortunately, we work with grays. I just hoped we worked with reds, blacks, or whites. Loaded terms such as agents of capital, working class, class struggle, territorial stigmatization, rights to social reproduction, have a ring of manifestos for us. They are more impediments than facilitators to our practice. They are highly seductive without being productive. You, you position your paper at the intersection of scholarship and activism. This is happening all the time in our own applied disciplines such as planning or even architecture, urban design. We have now terms such as design activism lately. However, I'm deeply suspicious of activism when it comes from the spatially focused fields of social sciences like geography. Why? Because geographers have the luxury to document, reflect, criticize, theorize, inform, and advise without getting their feet wet in decision making. They have the freedom to be as radical as they want and to intellectually enjoy it actually with no reality check at the end. Sorry from the geographers in the audience. <laughs> Hoping to have a more balanced and operational understanding of gentrification, I consulted your paper titled Missing Marcuse on Gentrification and Displacement. Why I consulted it? Be, although it consists of 18 pages just aimed at disqualifying any pro-gentrification theory. Okay. Again, brilliantly. I was much more interested in knowing and understanding what those gentrification supporters have to say. I don't know, all the time we hear the counter arguments okay so however the best part of the article for me was its ending where you quoted Marcuse and suddenly things came to place and here I quote from Marcuse and your article mm -hmm. the last question is not whether abandonment can be avoided gentrification controlled displacement eliminated or even how these things can be done but rather whether there is a desire to do that. That is a question that can only be answered in the political arena. So this led me to the general question that I'll be asking all through this conference. How can gentrification or rent gap theory, for instance, inform urban policy? 
what is the impact of gentrification analysis on decision making and how far this impact can be can pretend to be planetary or not i open the floor for questions hi good evening uh, muriel scaff uh, architect urban planner uh, thank you professor for your talk and uh, thank you uh, professor saliba for your intervention um, uh, first of all, I was going to ask a question uh, for Professor Slater, uh, Slater or Slater? Slater. <laughs> Professor Slater, but I would like to comment on the words uh, of Professor Saliba. Um, I am a designer, a planner, an architect. Uh, I'm also an activist. Everybody could be uh, in their own realm, not put wetting their feet or actually being dirty while criticizing. Uh, social theorists, critical theorists, but also architects who are always stuck in their design just on paper, serving one client and not caring about every, everybody else. So it's not just about critical theorists. Um, okay, so um, second of all, um, in terms of fighting gentrification, I know that um, it's a complicated issue, especially when global capital is involved and is circulated and you don't have only local players, but also multinationals, multinational corporations and uh, even philanthropic uh, uh, organizations like the World Economic Forum, so on and so forth. Um, but I would, was wanting to know your opinion about the Georgist um, concept of the land value tax and how it could help potentially solve the idea of gentrification or the um, rent cap. That okay. was my question. Would you like to take other questions or would you prefer to? Maybe we'll take a few more and I'll see yeah. if I can put things together. Please. Is that okay? Yeah. Amir. Um, I'm Amir um, I'm in the urban design program here. I'm an architect. Uh, my question is to Professor Slater. Um, what I understood is that the main issue with the rent cap is that it's actually being intentionally produced. Uh, through the devaluation of this land, mostly in the collaboration of the state. Mm -hmm. uh, so is this the main issue? And in that, uh, in that case, uh, if rent gap is a natural phenomenon, which is just happening because yeah, if it's a natural phenomenon, which is not intentionally produced, however, it's being uh, used by the uh, capitalists to, rein to reinstate actually higher classes where the poorer uh, classes were. Uh, can we criticize it in that matter? Or can we just consider it a natural phenomenon which is going on? If it's not intentionally produced. Did you say national or natural? Natural, natural phenomenon. Hi, I'm Ryan Sentner, London School of Economics. And uh, I'm a sociologist and a geographer. And uh, I want to let, let Tom there get a chance to get his, his notes down. but. Uh, I had a, a, a challenge about the question of unlearning and what this means and how it could actually be useful. So in both the, the paper that's on uh, Tom Slater's website, as well as the, the quote put up here, there's an emphasis on unlearning as a problem, as if, and casting this as, as if it were to throw away what we know about the rent gap and to, as you said, to sideline issues of large scale Mm -hmm. capitalist, uh, rentier, et cetera, kinds of, of, of play and effects in the world. But unlearning is meant in an anthropological or a classic ethno ethnographic sense of trying to make the familiar strange. Not throwing things away, not throwing away what we, what we know, but trying to look at how things might operate differently in a different kind of context. And certainly, it's not about ignoring how power might work, but thinking about how power exists always, but can be configured differently in a different context. So rather than throwing away the rent gap theory, this idea of unlearning and looking to new sites where we might understand gentrification differently, what it suggests, perhaps in Beirut, for example, if you were to walk around this area, other parts of Beirut, and see the shells that you talked about in your quote from Neil Smith, how those shells got there is through a very different process than what we would have learned about in the original rent gap idea. Mm -hmm. The rent gap can still apply though, but we have to take into consideration other local issues. War, diasporic ownership, perhaps ethnic, religious, stand taking, etc. 
And this can make our understanding of the rent gap and how it works different without throwing it away. It's frustrating because I think there are some different understandings of unlearning in the literature. Um, I kind of share your view of what unlearning means, but unfortunately there are some, there are some people in the literature on gentrification who are saying, or at least implying, uh, that uh, what we should do is forget that the rent gap theory ever existed and approach things uh, from a clean slate in the context that we're in and not let any of this Chicago or Philadelphia or wherever it pollute uh, uh, our understanding uh, of things going on. I've actually seen this kind of writing uh, and it certainly appeared uh, in the research for this paper. I, I kept coming across this. But the anthropological understanding that you've given is, I'm glad you gave it, because that kind of clarifies, and I think, what unlearning should be about. And I couldn't agree more with the way that you presented that. So my rea when I had that critique of unlearning, I was thinking of some of the writing that I encountered, uh, which had suggested that these theories are not useful at all. Uh, there are some people in the literature, in, well, if, if you look at some of the citations that are very helpfully, I can't remember them, if you look at some of the citations helpfully in the introduction to Global Gentrifications, that book that's just come out, there are some uh, things there. But also, actually, some of the uh, writing, I think, of um, um, some of the summaries I've seen of post-colonial theory can often give that impression, too. Some of these sort of literature review papers, right? If you look at some of the thing, the interventions of Colin McFarlane uh, and some of the writings actually uh, of um, Jenny Robinson can sometimes give this view of unlearning. Uh, I've actually seen them give the view that is not the anthropological view that you've given. Um, so um, going to the other, the second question I was asked about the devaluation of land and if this is natural and not intentionally produced. In a way, I can see how... Um, the question of intentionality would come to the forefront in, in my, how this, how this could be the, a, a reaction to what I was um, doing. Um, what I'm trying to emphasize here is that this is not about some sort of grand conspiracy theory. Uh, this is not about people sitting around a table uh, saying, you know what, we really need to take this part of the city back and really make sure those people suffer. Right? That doesn't happen, right? Or at least it might happen, but I've not come across it happening. Um, I think what I tried to convey uh, was that cities, um, to, to imply or to claim that things just evolve means that we miss political struggles that are taking place. Uh, and we miss, crucially, the way that often governments, by actively courting, various forms of uh, investment, i.e. in the secondary circuits of accumulation, uh, if, we, if we think that this is something that just happened, then we tend to miss, uh, I think, some of the things which are happening um, and their consequences. Um, going to the first question on the land value tax, this is a difficult question because it's so dependent on the context. Um, but just to take an, a, a case I know better than uh, this region, London, if there was a land value tax in London, my goodness me. Uh, and if that was to be redistributed, my goodness me. Uh, London is a, like a property developer bonanza. Um, if there was any form of taxation on land, uh, it would be, and if, that, and if the money that was raised via taxation was to be spent improving the housing conditions of people uh, living in, uh, for example, social housing estates, uh, that would be what I would call progressive urban policy. Um, to come to some of the points that, that you raised, Robert, and, um, in terms of, uh, I suppose, you know, the difficulty of um, applying this sort of Marxist uh, urbanist analysis uh, to, to, I suppose, what we might call the real world, um, there, are, um, you know, there are problems here. I'm acutely aware of these. Um, but I also think that we are sometimes too timid uh, in our analyses because of what happened to Marxist grand narratives, because of the critiques which uh, justifiably uh, emerged uh, in, from various strands of social science, from feminism all the way through to post-colonial theory. Um, and I think we're sometimes too timid because of what happened to Marxist politics. Um, and we forget that there might be lessons that we could learn and there are ways of understanding the circulation of capital um, and I think sometimes we don't go down the Marxist route because of the stigma attached to, to doing so. 
Um, and in terms of, I mean, I've never heard somebody saying that geographers have a luxury to do anything. Um, I, I, <laughs> it, does, it certainly doesn't feel like that. And I, you know, I, I am, I'm more than aware that the position of scholarship is much more comfortable than the position of um, activism and the position of trying to make a difference in the realm of policy. Um, but I don't think that means that I, 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 I like to think that I've not backed away uh, from those. And indeed, man, many of my writings on gentrification, especially the one missing Marcuse that you mentioned, these were drawn from taking part uh, in various campaigns uh, that were all about trying to uh, protect affordable housing. Um, so, you know, I, I, maybe I plead guilty and that perhaps my position is too comfortable, but then I, I suppose I just tend to come down to what, what do we feel is most useful in helping us explain what is going on and thinking of things that might be done um, uh, to, to address that. Um, now, I suppose the Marx, you know, the, the pure Marxists would say, oh, we need, you know, socialist revolution now uh, in terms of things that should be done. But there are some lessons like the land value tax, for example, that, that may uh, make some progressive things. I mean, another one is rent controls, but again, they, sometimes rent controls can actually be abused to actually increase uh, uh, various forms of accumulation. So, yeah, I, I'm well aware of the, of the issues that, that uh, you're raising. Uh, Hisham, a shower PhD candidate at, um, well, uh, in Kultur der Metropole at Hafen City in Fashita at Hamburg. Uh, my question is, well, it's hard to ask you a question because I nearly agree with most of what you said, but um, I'll be a bit critical. Uh, all those media titles you showed us that uh, try to, um, well, okay, there's this continuous conflict on the use of the term gentrification by capital or other. But don't you think that, in a way, leftist or radical researcher contributed in uh, making these headlines by keep on expanding the definition of gentrification? Uh, for example, if I read the definition you gave, class transformation of space, this doesn't include a change in population or an expulsion. It can be literally like French, like uh, un bourgeois mode d'espace. Yeah. So it's social ascension. Mm -hmm. And maybe the same people who are living there has climbed the social hierarchy. And also the Hackworth definition, mm -hmm. production of space for more uh, affluent users, it doesn't include that there is a displacement. And here I'm, I favor Eric Clark's definition. R uh, remind me of that one, if you have it. The Eric uh, Eric Clark. Uh, yeah. Eric Clark is uh, like, um, for him, gentrification is a production of an upgraded space through capital investments accompanied by a change of population of land users okay. with no, more affluent, with different socio, higher socio-economic uh, status, uh, replace the other one. Yeah. And uh, also in your book, Gentrification, you said that you disagree with uh, this approach of Eric Clark, especially his article on the sim uh, simplicity and uh, order of gentrification. If you just can explain this. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my name is Ernesto Lopez Morales. Uh, not a question really, but a reflection on fantastic translator's presentation. Um, I think the rent gap uh, seen from a planetary level uh, puts us uh, in between two different narratives or processes. Uh, the first one is the academic debate on the theory, and the second one is a, a politically engaged activism and grassroots mobilization. Uh, I'm going to explain why. Uh, on the first one hand, uh, as you said, uh, there are some scholars, yeah, not, not really few scholars, but many, um, that uh, reject that, this kind of theories. And, uh, from post-colonial, from uh, <laughs> sort of maybe too empirically oriented kind of research they are advocating now. Uh, maybe that's related to uh, tradition, Anglo-American uh, urban academia, uh, highly uh, empirically uh, informed. Uh, so they want to come back to that in many ways, uh, or they feel um, um, urban theories has been too much confused by different perspective and narratives, uh, trying to interpret uh, Jenny Robinson and Colin McFarland, you, you, mm -hmm. you, you mentioned. Um, I'm not really sure in the introduction of the global gentrifications, uh, mm -hmm. there are some authors that uh, reject 
mm -hmm. gap theory, as maybe you implied. But um, of no. course, we, we okay. there there are some 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 hints to to ideas of other authors that might lead to that understanding uh, of of this problem. Um, but that kind of uh, uh, skepticism uh, towards rank gap theory intrigues me too, and and, and I think it's due to uh, maybe uh, I wonder I'm wondering now um, uh, rampantly anti-Marxist perspective or politically uh, biased way of seeing urban change. I mean, uh, in many ways, uh, this guy is as as, as uh, post-structuralist or um, um, Comparativist mm -hmm. perspective, uh, trying to do this uh, empirically oriented uh, research, advocating that. But it, the real thing is some politically biased, why not to say right wing perspective on, on reality or anti Marxist reality. Maybe it's that. Maybe it's that motivates. That's uh, so true rejection, which is real. I mean, I've, I've smelled that also in, in some yeah. authors I've yeah. listened to recently. But what, what, what I find interesting is that, on the other hand, Renga theory everywhere I've had the chance to visit is something that can be explained and that people, grassroots activists, mm -hmm. understand and use mm -hmm. and apply yeah. to their everyday realities. And something useful for struggling, um, mm -hmm. facing uh, urban change and facing the powers of uh, capitalism and powers of investors and powers of states at its different levels to transform their, their environment. So I'm going to leave this comment here, but okay. I hope yeah. you understood what I tried to say. Can we take one more question? Yes, uh, Mona, head of um, urban studies and politics. Thank you very much for uh, the keynote the talk, very inspiring. I'd like uh, to pick your brain on the intersections between the theory of planetary urbanism and the RAND gap, mm -hmm. which um, uh, I'm trying to understand, I think you, you pointed to the transnational circulation of capital as one intersection that you find mm -hmm. interesting, mm -hmm. if you can elaborate a little bit on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, a response to that debate about the intersection between what you said and uh, applied, uh, applied policy, I, d I did find intersections uh, through that were not probably addressed in the keynote, but we cannot ask you to do everything. Yes. I'm sure we're, <laughs> we're going to go back to that. But I thought that uh, your plea for uh, urban research on gentrification was very interesting for activists, actually, right. to really understand and unpack what's happening empirically mm -hmm. in uh, neighborhoods through uh, identifying mm -hmm. the actors of capital uh, changes. Yeah. I think there are many possibilities that yeah. can be identified for intervening in terms of urban policy. So I think okay. you should be, okay. you should defend that okay. in your talk. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, let me just get my head around my notes here. Um, going to the question, actually both the question from Ernesto and from Mona, they, they both um, actually raised the question of grassroots mobilization. Um, and struggles and sort of the, the links between scholarship and activism. Um, I think one of the most powerful things about the rent gap theory um, is that it encourages us to dispense with this view that people like hipsters are the problem. Or you know, like they, one of the kind of hallmarks of 1980s uh, sort of activism uh, or even propaganda was, you know, die yuppies, you know yuppies go home, this kind of thing. And uh, the rent gap invites us to look a little deeper than that. Uh, so yuppies go home is not, or, you know, hipsters are invading, you know, is not, you know, it's not actually a very sound analysis of gentrification. Um, and I think that the rent gap leads us to uh, consider, you know, what is actually driving this, you know, the, the changes that, that activists see and the, the, and, and the rising housing costs. Um, so um, I hope that, answer, that kind of comes back to your comment and that answers the second part of your question. The first question on the transnational circulation, well, yeah, this is, I suppose that one of the things that I was really interested in in this planetary urbanization literature was this concept of neo housemanization mm -hmm. right? And that what we are seeing uh, in many different national contexts 
is, uh, for example, foreign investment in land, foreign investment in housing, um, and uh, this is producing uh, waves of evictions, uh, often with force, that perhaps uh, we've not seen on this particular scale in so many different places. Um, and I suppose the question then becomes, well, how can the rent gap theory be useful uh, in looking at these, uh, this neo-housemanization? Um, now, we have to, I think we're going to hear from Andrew tomorrow more about some of these metaphors from 19th century uh, Paris uh, and whether they, uh, you know, sometimes they might, you know, we might get so kind of romantic about what happened there that we might fail to see, you know, what, what is happening uh, in where we are today. But I do feel as if, uh, you know, the, the rent gap, sometimes even if you look at some of the textbooks, as I've said, I, I have a problem with these textbooks of urban studies or, you know, key concepts in urban studies and things like that, you, you just don't get the sense that the rent gap is of any use anymore. It's sort of something that was done in the 1970s and 80s, debated, done, we're moving on. And I found that to be quite problematic. Um, going to the first question um, about the expansion of the definition, which is, uh, I'm glad you raised this question. Um, I suppose the, I, I chose the definition, the class transformation of space. Uh, mainly because I was thinking about the, the, the issue of displacement in all its forms. So the common classic image of gentrification is that it's a, you know, a, a landlord issuing an eviction notice to a tenant uh, in a building that already exists. And, uh, but we see the class transformation of space much more broadly. Uh, and I think when we think about, for example, the construction of housing for a certain type of resident, uh, i.e. people with the ability to pay for luxury housing, uh, or, you know, not quite luxury housing. Um, I think we have to that, consider that as a form of displacement as well. Peter Marcuse does when he calls it exclusionary displacement because mm. people are excluded from living in that particular part of the city. Um, so when I used the class transformation of space, I was thinking of the dangers of not using gentrification to capture what is often uh, policies and uh, strategies that are for a certain type of person at the expense of another, right? In terms of the class categories that we use. So um, in terms of the whether we disagree, uh, I actually thought that we agree with Eric Clark uh, in our book, but it, this could be the hazard of writing with two other people. <laughs> uh, so I don't, I don't remember disagreeing with Eric Clark, um, but it could have been Loretta or Elvin. I'm not sure they did either. Um, so um, yeah, I, I thought you need to direct me to where we've done that. Um, uh, we'll take one more okay. round yep. question. I want to uh, follow uh, Professor Saliba's uh, uh, point of uh, questioning the use of gentrification research and theorizing on the reality, on changing things on the ground. So I want to pose two uh, basic, very basic questions, probably for the uh, coming sessions in the conference as well, but maybe for uh, uh, Tom Slatter as a keynote speaker to respond to. Uh, the first is, w what is the uh, alternative to gentrification? I mean, mm. if we think that gentrification is not good, we have to prevent it, and regardless of the uh, uh, strategies to, to do that, um, but from a, a very practical and pragmatic point of view, what is the alternative? And the more follow-on question of that is, who would provide this alternatives? Would it come from the uh, residents themselves uh, or do we expect still the state to rejuvenate its role uh, as a guardian of the public good or social justice? And that leads me to my second basic question which is if there is any correlation between the Arab uprising in the Middle Eastern countries and any impact whatsoever on gentrification because also you've mentioned, uh, Tom, something like a social revolution or something like that. Mm -hmm. I know that we can debate for the rest of the night whether what happened in the Arab countries is really a social revolution or not, but I'm sure that it had some also I impact. And um, maybe we need to ponder a little bit whether this also touches upon an uneven urban development, including gentrification and displacement or not. This, these are very interesting questions to, uh, to, to go back to during the closing session, I think. Can I, can I answer just uh, the, the 
or, or do okay. you want to take it even? No, no, uh, uh, as you want. Okay. Um, uh, just in terms of what is the alternative, um, I mean, this is a question that I've been thinking about for, God, for a long time. Um, I keep coming back to something which I, sp I, I, I emphasized it uh, early on when I talked about the politics of the rent gap theory and how those politics are often removed from it in some of the debates and what some people who have actually worked with the theory have often missed. Um, and this is that it puts the social, uh, the social value of land above its commercial value. And therefore, I feel that if any alternative to gentrification um, might really make some steps, I think that it has to be ones that are organized around the social ownership of land. Uh, now, in terms of who is going to provide it or provide that alternative, um, I think that <laughs> the first thing uh, to, one of the things which I've seen uh, in the literature is just how many elected officials in various contexts uh, or even not elected officials, uh, seem to be able to invest in land and housing. Uh, and the amount of money uh, that politicians are making, either through shares or through their own large construction companies, uh, from uh, the secondary circuit of accumulation. So uh, I think if there is to be an alternative of gentrification, uh, to gentrification, I think uh, there should be legal requirements or constitutional requirements that elected officials should not have interests uh, that are to do with uh, accruing vast amounts of money uh, through the housing market. Um, and and I, the third part about the uh, Arab uprising, and this is uh, really difficult for me to answer because I am not an expert at all. And I, I, I will think I, there's many more people we'll in this room who can, who can do that. Yeah. Um, I, I do have a little question about, or um, a little statement kind of to make. Uh, what's the role of the education system? or the universities, at least, in the gentrification process. Uh, one, because it's, it is a global network that works on a global scale. Two, um, because I have studied in EUB and later on taught in EUB, and I more saw the gentrification process happening inside the campus than actually outside, from privatization to price of goods to quality of students coming in. Um, and I was wondering if this maybe could hold an answer to a counter-gentrification process that starts from an education system, or I don't know what, uh, what to really make out of it. But I was just wondering why it's uh, maybe absent from the whole conversation that hmm. happened now. Hmm. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Uh, please. No, uh, Fran, please. Fran Tonkis, London School of Economics. Um, an observation and a question. Firstly, I just wanted to um, underline part of what I see of the, as the importance of the rent gap theory in helping us to make sense of processes which the concept of gentrification doesn't necessarily capture very well, where, for example, um, displacement has occurred much earlier uh, in, his, you know, in an historical period due to different processes, including conflict. Uh, for example, um, or in the case of peripheral developments on land which was formerly part of the local ecosystem services and was, you know, there were very different uses but not necessarily residential users being displaced and rent gap theory helps us to, to think about those kinds of development which clearly have parallels with gentrification but don't fit into perhaps any of the the primary definitions. My question, though, what really concerns the hipsters or the, you know, the high-end incomers or the offshore investors, um, the, the consumer sovereigns yeah. that, following Neil Smith, yeah. you wanted to, to sideline in this picture. And I appreciate why you want to do that, and I share that. But when we bring them back in um, and we think about class struggle, uh, you know, gentrification in respect of class struggle, um, then we need to think, I guess, about intra-class struggles, that different parts of urban middle classes competing over space, either competing in the housing market or competing over the symbolic occupation of space. You said very nicely, we mustn't shortchange the symbolic. And mm. a lot of this has to do with how we think about our city, who it belongs to, who it's for, mm. who its public spaces are supposed to serve. Um, and so, you know, the, the hipsters, who are renting privately are, are in struggle with other people who are renting privately yeah. in the city. Yeah. And then the, you know, the, 
the offshore investors who are coming and letting to, to very high-end renters are creating struggles with other middle-class residents you know, who have been there. So I just wanted to say something more, I guess, about those intra-class struggles, not that just between mm -hmm. property capital and those who are marginalized by it, but amongst those more or less sovereign consumers in the city. Bruce Oitema, University of Oxford. Uh, my question is also uh, related to the uh, previous question. You mentioned that class struggle uh, in rent cap theory is not between hipsters and, and the uh, working class. I understand why you said that, but on the other hand, you mentioned the uh, 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 lack of data, or you mentioned uh, rent cap theory remained within the demand and supply uh, discussions. Don't you think this is uh, also related with uh, when you consider rent cap uh, uh, by referring it to more macro processes? Uh, because this leaves uh, researchers uh, without any tools to do uh, research, uh, uh, more empirical studies of uh, gent uh, gentrification research. And um, uh, yeah. Um. The role of the education system is a great question. Um, I'm acutely aware that the, my employer is a major holder of land titles in Edinburgh um, and is actively developing student housing under the guise of, oh, you know, we're being kind, providing affordable housing uh, to, you know, to all our undergraduates uh, who are, and postgraduates who are coming here uh, to study. Um, you know, they, they tend to sort of, you know, they, they don't talk too much about the amazing amounts of money that they're bringing in um, via the land titles that they have. Um, and this has actually been well documented uh, in, uh, certainly in America, where, you know, universities are major investors of uh, land. And I don't know in the Middle East if that's the case. Um, in terms of the education system, so were you saying that the education system can actually be something which can be mobilized as an anti-gentrification? Well, hopefully, via simply knowing more about gentrification uh, would be my immediate answer to that. But again, it's difficult for me to, to answer beyond that because, of, you know, uh, other than, you know, trying to make sure that my students are aware of these processes, uh, it's difficult for me to sort of think more broadly about that. Um, but I need more time. <laughs> um, the, the second question was about the sovereign consumer and intra-class struggles. Uh, it, I'm trying to think of something that would be meaningful, uh, bearing in mind that I'm tired. Um, and there's a huge asymmetry between a middle class family living in London, in the private rented sector, for example, and uh, the major investors of land and real estate right, in that city. Um, and I, I suppose that's what I've tried to, to highlight. Um, and in terms of the symbolic struggles, and you know, this is, again, I just, I, there's not a great deal of work on the symbolic actually in, in the field of gentrification scholarship. We, we tend to know quite a lot about why a middle class family will choose Brixton to, you know, while, you know and why the education system in London uh, is, you know, sometimes all kinds of segregation along the lines of class can develop. Uh, around people trying to find good schools for their kids, and actually not just London, many other places this has been studied. Um, but I suppose I, I, I would still e emphasize the fact that if we get too kind of occupied with the intra-class struggles uh, at any position in the class structure, I think we might tend to miss where, where the real struggle is. So uh, probably not the answer you were hoping for, but I, I just, uh, the sovereign, uh, I suppose I've been so kind of occupied looking at the top and the bottom that maybe it's difficult to me, for me to say anything meaningful about the intra-class, especially in the middle, right? Um, the final question, I'm, I'm going to have to ask you to clarify because I wasn't quite sure what you were asking me. Uh, uh, so if, uh, if we uh, refer to rent cap theory in a more macro level of uh, class struggle, which uh, refers to more macro analysis of uh, capital or investment, mm. disinvestment, then don't you think this, uh, and when you say the, the class struggle between, is not between hipsters and the working class, so if you put, put it like this, mm. then it's uh, quite possible to find examples of uh, gentrification research which refers to rent cap. It's like the neoliberalism literature. 
you know, uh, you quote Harvey and you quote Neil Smith and you become critical, but there is no empirical data. So it's kind of leading uh, researchers to uh, give and uh, don't giving enough tools uh, for researchers to oh, do anything. Yeah. So it just refers it to a, as a general. Okay, no, it's right. I, I understand what you're asking me. Um, in terms of uh, this being uh, a sort of theoretical contribution, well, I suppose the the remit that I had or the instructions I had from the special issue editors was engage with Neil's work, uh, and I engaged at the level of theory. Um, I would be abs you're absolutely spot on if you were saying, where's the evidence? Uh, and where are the tools and how do we go about doing kind of work like this? I did, I hope, give some research topics and research questions that we could work with uh, in, my, in my presentation there. But uh, yeah, no, there's no data. But I, I like to think that uh, you know, these arguments that I'm making are drawn from many years of, of uh, especially qualitative work. Um, and what I'm doing at the moment is more work in, the, in looking at the, the role of think tanks. Uh, in the context I live in, and how they have actually uh, become so, so damaging in terms of people's general understanding uh, of the issues uh, that they face, and how actually people end up thinking uh, the opposite to what they should be thinking about the situation that they are in, right, and the situation that their neighbours are in. Um, so you're right if, 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 you know, if, if you're saying about, you know, the where can we go if there's no data, then you know, I plead guilty in that presentation. But I also like to think that there are some, hopefully some clues uh, as to where we might go uh, if this theory, which I do think is incredibly powerful, uh, is, is to become useful in terms of not just understanding, but also for resisting. So. Many thanks, Tom, again.